Good afternoon, this is Julie Cox, and we welcome you to this afternoon's um, webinar Wednesday with Dr. Cox. Our focus this week is going to continue with the thoracic spine theme, and we're talking about the thoracic spine spondylosis. The notes will have been downloaded through your email. If you have any questions about that, you can let me know. But we will continue today and with some information on thoracic spine spondylosis as well as a demonstration. So I'm going to turn this over to Dr. <coughs> James Cox and let him go with this theme. Thanks, Julie. In our webinar two weeks ago, we discussed thoracic disc herniation, which is a complex and somewhat difficult condition to treat, to understand, to diagnose, understand the biomechanics of, and to treat. So we covered that, and today we're going to discuss thoracic spine discogenic spondylosis. These are patients without radicular component. If they have a radicular component, they're going to be treated strictly with protocol one as we did in the last webinar. As with the lumbar or a cervical spine, if we look at the average day in the clinical practice, very few of these patients have radicular pain, whether it be in the neck, the low back. I think you would agree that some days you may not even see a radicular patient. The more you specialize in spine, however, and get known for it, the more radicular patients you see because you will attract more spinal stenosis conditions. So the thoracic spine is no different than cervical or low back. When we're dealing with radicular component in the thoracic spine, we treat only with protocol one, as we did in our last webinar. When we're dealing with a person who has spine pain without radicular component, just spine pain, loss of physiological range of motion, we treat them as protocol two, which is the gist of our discussion today. I would like to make mention that if you're interested in this, this is the fourth edition of a textbook I've published called Neck, Shoulder, Arm Pain, What It Is and How It Is Treated. It has a large section <clears throat> on thoracic spine spondylosis, and then here's a book on low back pain that contains thoracal lumbar pain. This is seventh edition published by Lippincott Williams and Wilkins. Incidentally, royalties from the text goes for spine research. So let's move on with our discussion of thoracic spine spondylotic care. This again is a algorithm of treatment which you can print out. It's, and it's part of the handouts. It's part of the handouts. Big. You can read it nice and clearly. Okay. I'm not going to go through this with you. I'm going to actually demonstrate what these uh, papers show you. So um, Hippocrates himself, I always like this comment about the history of chiropractic from Grassi and Pearl. They get knowledge of the spine, for this is the requisite for many human diseases. Hippocrates said that, and here is Hippocrates. This is Hippocrates treating the thoracic and the thoracal lumbar spine. That patient is probably Escalapius, <laughs> you know, but they were using what property? Traction. He used distraction, applying a spinal adjustment. Why did he apply distraction? The same reason we do. It opens the disc space. It increases foramenal area up to 28%. It drops intradiscal pressures from a positive to a negative intradiscal centripetal force to pull back herniated disc material. It allows us to put the faucet and the triple joint complex through their physiological ranges of motion, which creates number five, afferentation, that is stimulation of the substantia gelatinosa of Rolando to rostrally transmit touch, pressure, and temperature impulses to the somatosensory cortex to cause the corticospinal tract to carry back endorphins to the, from the periaqueduct to gray matter, the mu and copper receptors in the dual album, God of the pituitary, back down to the motor end plate to sedate pain. So we have a long history 
of manipulation going back to Hippocrates himself. We have just, I think, somewhat improved the distraction instrument over a, a rope and two guys pulling on a, a fulcrum. So if we're looking at a CT, <clears throat> this is computed tomography of discogenic spondylosis. Every disc in the spine is degenerate. There's nothing here that's unusual from the patients that you and I see each day in clinical practice. And yet that's what makes this a very important conference, that webinar, that we are having together. So two weeks ago, three weeks ago, my pleasure was to deliver the lecture on diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis. And when we have these large anterior flowing wax calcifications of the anterior ligament, these people, two things. Number one, they still have facet joints that can be moved. But number two, they will not tolerate hard spinal thrust adjusting. Therefore, we use a technique called Cox long y-axis distraction. Here you see fused anterior longitudinal ligament, large claw-like, syndesmophyte-like calcifications with preservation of the disc. And note again how well-preserved the faucet joints are in DISH. So we can move faucet joints. Unless you were looking carefully at obliques, you might miss DISH in this patient until you looked here and said, well, what are these things, you know? Perineural cysts, small toroidal cysts can occur anywhere in the spine, not just in the sacrum. Here they are bilateral, perineural cysts. You look here, here they are at multi-levels. These are conditions that you and I might want to strongly consider not doing high-velocity thrust technique, but rather gentle, tolerance-tested, distraction mobilization technique that we have developed. We look here at degenerative thoracic disease with ankylosis, hyperkyphosis. These patients can be quite difficult. A PA thrust may well cause pain. Instead of that, we, as you see, we will use long y-axis distraction. We will begin with manual tolerance testing, manual distraction, we will go to automated attended long y axis traction and unattended automated long y axis distraction of such spines. And what about degenerative scoliosis and hyperkyphosis? Compression defects throughout a level with a greater than 25 degree thoracic spine gibbous flexion deformity. You note the, the we see these patients, they got scoliosis, they're not going to tolerate a lot of um, violent thrust manipulation. Thus, consider the treatment we are about to demonstrate. Here again, a case that you and I see every day as manipulating physicians. In plate hypertrophy, calcific anterior ligament changes, vacuum phenomenon of Knudsen, unstable segments, anterolateral fusions. With careful tolerance testing, we can go to each of these motion segments, apply distraction, apply physiological range of motion, apply physiological therapeutics in order to create ventral and lateral spinothalamic tract rostral transmission of touch, pressure, and temperature to produce the endorphins within the brain. So we look at this case, bilateral stenosis. I presented this case two weeks ago as disc herniation. Indeed, disc herniation, ligamentum flavum thickening, stenosis. So once this patient attains 50% relief of their radicular component, they will become the patient we are treating today, treated as protocol two, 
discogenic spondylotic change with careful tolerance testing before we apply any distraction manipulation of the spine. So we talk about Schormann's disease. We'll talk about the hyperreflexia of Schormann's disease. So we will look at the treatment of these conditions manually, attended and unattended long y-axis automated distraction at this time. So we are treating thoracic pain without radicular component. Here, this is, the, this is a, an extremely common patient that you treat and I treat all day, every day. That's why it's so important to discuss perhaps a viable additional complementary care for your patient. When we are treating thoracic degeneration, you may or may not use the ankle cuff restraint. I'm going to treat without ankle cuff restraint with holding one ankle and then the other ankle as a distractive force. And we would begin like this, my colleague. We will begin manually and I'll come up in mid-thoracic spine and just tolerance test. Manually I'm going to distract with an equal force cephalward and caudan. I'm going to move down from mid around T8 level T7 and just ask the patient are you okay with this? Does this in any way cause you spine, low back, buttock, leg pain? Do you feel any discomfort in your spine when I do this? And they say, no. Then we will proceed. And I'll begin by applying long y-axis distraction manually. And then if they tolerate that, I'm going to do it long y-axis attended distraction. It looks like this. I'm pressing the tiller bar button to control individual segment distraction. And I say, are you okay with this? And I'll move down every level of the thoracic spine, well into the thoracolumbar, and even into the upper lumbar spine, applying about two pounds to three pounds of force per segment. If that's well accepted, I'll release the lateral flexion lever and begin to apply a coupled movement of lateral flexion and flexion in a rhythmical coupled movement. From mid thoracic all the way down into the lumbar spine. Because if you've got these changes in the thoracic spine, are you not going to see them in the lumbar? Almost always. And all the time, asking the patient, are you okay with this? Does this cause you any discomfort? Please note another way you can do this. Observe if I hold the mid thoracic, I apply a distraction. I can stop this instrument. Now watch this. I hold, distract. As I feel the interspinous space is open, I can lock the table at that point and under distraction apply. You okay, Rick? Mm -hmm. I can apply lateral flexion under decompression distraction at each level of the lumbar spine. Okay. Lock the instrument. In treating lower thoracic from mid thoracic down and lumbar spine and these patients who show a lot of degenerative disc disease we can apply specific level distraction 
with or without manually applied physiological range of motion, V of V. If I take this thoracic restraint, wherever I put this, from that level down will be where I apply a distraction force. So here, If I want to apply thoracolumbar, lumbar, you okay, Britt? Yep. I've got my thoracic restraint. I set the computer to automate it. And with a very minimal of one and a half to no more than two inches of distraction vector motion of the caudal section, I apply long y-axis distraction. Now as I do that, I ask them, my patient, are you okay with that? Yeah. Does that bother you any, Rick? No. Yeah. I want to know everything about this guy. Does this in any way aggravate you? If you place your fingertips between the spinous processes, and in your mind you remember the work that was done at Logan with ultrasound measurement and incidentally, we have bought an ultrasound at Kaiser University College of Chiropractic Medicine in West Palm Beach. When you do this, you can feel the interspinous spaces move. But with ultrasound, we will be watching them move. And we will determine the movement of the intervertebral disc space, the foraminal area, as we apply long y-axis distraction. We already know. Now, for example, in a study at Logan, that L23 will go from 0.8 to 1.10 millimeters. It's an enormous amount of motion, and you can palpate that with your fingers. That's the future that we will be doing in research. The additional treatment of hysteresis, that is to increase the imbibition of fluids from the cancellous vertebral body through the end plate into the nucleus of the disc. In order to enhance that, because we're putting these patients on with degenerative disc disease, we're putting them on glycosaminal glycan, chondroitine sulfate, pernican alloculus, at least 2,000 milligrams to three a day. So this is in the serum. So as we distract, we imbibe fluid through the disc. We give them curcumin, disc and joint pain. This is curcumin and turmeric root with black pepper, which lowers cytokine inflammation. We put them on high B6, 9, 11, and 12 to convert homocysteine into methionine and lower the chemical inflammation and lower reactive oxidative species presence. Now, if we want to increase the hysteresis on the instrument, I can set this. Now, watch. It will hold at one second of detente. Then it will move to neutral. If I set it again, it will go to two seconds of detente. So with that, we are holding a distraction. We are separating the disc. By the work of diffusion-weighted imaging and the work of Beati et al., you know that a successful manipulation sees, shows that there is imbibition of fluid into the disc from the cancerous vertebral body. That's people who show good relief with a single spinal adjustment. So we do this to enhance fluid imbibition into the intervertebral disc nucleus pulposus. Detente, unattended, long y-axis distraction. Then, in order to add manipulation to it and mobilization, we release the lateral flexion lever. And as this thing applies distraction, we will apply lateral flexion. You okay, Rick? Yep. Under distraction, I'm placing each of the motion segments into physiological range of motion. Now, please watch this. If I relax, the, release the flexion extension lever, 
Now I apply distraction and lateral flexion in a coupled movement. This is called circumduction. This is the strongest manipulation that we can give to a patient. It's almost like a goal of spinal manipulation is to give our patient the best return of these physiological motions that we can. Now many of you think that you'll just get an instrument that automatically pulls a patient apart. Um, that's your choice. However, you don't have the advantage of physiological range of motion stimulating the affrontation, which is 50% of the benefit of spinal manipulation. It's not controlled. You're pulling a whole spine. We are pulling the segment, the specific segments that require decompression, increased foraminal area, dropped intradiscal pressure, and increase in imbibition of fluids into the disc. The treatment of discogenic spondylosis from mid to lower thoracic spine. Now, next, we release this, and we're going to take this off, and when we are dealing with discogenic changes of the upper thoracic spine, we can again use occipital restraint, which we did for our upper thoracic disc. It's only which upper thoracic is the most common disc herniation level? One, two. So with this in place, just keep in mind that I can release my levers. Contact the mid thoracic and use a cephalward force to apply distraction of the triple joint complexes from the mid throughout the upper thoracic spine. I can release the rotation lever, apply long y-axis distraction, lateral flexion and rotation in a coupled motion throughout the spondylotic segment, always beginning with distraction, tolerance testing, does this cause you any discomfort at all? This is an area that people really appreciate. It's very sedating. These are sympathetic nerves, and in the world we live in, we have a lot of sympathetic tension that we live with every day. This relieves sympathetic atonia, the lateral flexion, rotation, and distraction in a smooth, rhythmical couple pattern. If you didn't do anything else with this work but treat the upper thoracic, what we used to call the T4 syndrome, then it was called the upper thoracic syndrome, now it's called the T1 through T12 syndrome, okay? So if we didn't do anything but treat all of these areas with this technique, we will help people. Now with this occipital restraint in place, I'd like you to notice that in manipulation, in adjusting the thoracic spine, if we can leave the occipital restraint on or we can take it off. When we manipulate through a thoracic spine, and this is any one thing that you'll want to begin to use with this work, in, in my opinion, it's learning to not thrust the thoracic, but rather to make the contact, hold that PA force, and let the caudal section move downward as we apply long y-axis distraction to create increased disc space height, drop intradiscal pressure, increase foraminal area, and create afferentation. It's a very gentle technique. You can also do it without occipital restraint. And please follow. Contact, no thrust. Just make the contact. We 
we apply long y-axis distraction. Now observe frame and bottom pump. I like to end each of my manipulations with frame and bottom pump. Place the basic occiput here. Reinforce the occipital restraint and gently apply long y-axis distraction. You okay, Rick? Yep. Long y-axis distraction. And as you move down, you can place the spinous between the thenar and the hypothenar. Apply long y-axis distraction using lower extremity weight as the distraction force. And adjust the spine throughout the thoracic spine. If you're treating Schormann's disease, hyperkyphosis, gibbous changes, Kummel's disease, this is a very gentle way of treating. There are some other techniques that we use for treating these, but these are very good, substantial, basic approaches, which with tolerance testing and asking the patient if they tolerate this, these are beautiful approaches to treating thoracic spine with radicular pain, as we did two weeks ago, without radicular pain, just a lot of degenerative disc disease and spinal stenosis throughout the thoracic spine. All with tolerance testing, fair, careful neurological findings and constant uh, awareness, constant testing for any change in patient neurological or orthopedic signs. Uh, that's enough. I'm going to stop there. If you ever study with us in didactics, you'll do this, you'll feel this. We show you more patients. We even show you more techniques. But for me, I think that's enough for one day. Are well, there any questions? None right now, but I'm going to oh. go through these. Um, we have to set our June date for the next webinar, but I think we were talking about doing spondylolisthesis. So once we have that set, we'll let you know. Just keep in touch with us through our, all of our other outlets. Um, if you do want more information, I know Dr. Olding's lecture on thoracic disc herniation is still really good. He gives you a great overview of the um, um, examination of the thoracic spine and treatment. And then we have our workshops, and they certainly get into thoracic spine. We try to, the workshop leaders, We'll go through cervical, lumbar, and thoracic, and any questions that you might have. So the workshops are really great because they're really small, uh, two to six people max, and it can really be specialized to what you want to learn. The online courses, we have a lot to choose from. You're welcome to do those. Those are with CE credits, so you have the questions and certificates uh, by hour. And then we'll be doing some live courses the rest of this year. We've got, a part, we've got part one, two, three, which is cervical. Um, the four thoracic will be uh, next spring, another one of those, but the online version should be up and running um, very soon. And then this fall we're doing the extremity spine and uh, sports and rehab course in September. So join us for that. Please contact Amanda with any questions about the COX-8 force table, force or non-force. The force is nice to have, right over have to now. have that. And then um, the, our net, other ways to get in touch with us, coxtechnique.com. So, we appreciate your being here today. Have a Julie, yeah. Can I make one comment? Yes. These four-hour classes, we have several instructors that teach them in their own office. Four hours where you just do this to one another. You learn what it feels like, how to do it. When you come here, I'm in my research office. You come to me. You're in this room with me, and we uh, we do this repeatedly according to protocol, uh, and I guarantee you that my findings are, when doctors come, that they're not doing our work the way that we teach it. So this helps you to have a foundation of using Cox Technique. Yeah. The individualization of the workshops, because you have such small groups, is great. So, yeah. so contact, contact me with any questions.
Otherwise, go back into your office this afternoon and take care of those thoracic spine patients and those with upper four thoracic syndrome because we're all part of that group. So thanks again for spending time with us this afternoon, and uh, we'll see you next time.